every single patient we see who has a problem on his or her hand will teach us something. Let us see what today's case study is going to teach us in this series on learning from case studies. Manakkam. When you have fractures of the metacarpals of the fingers, they can be managed either conservatively with just a POP or they may need operative management. But when the fractures of the metacarpals involves the base of the metacarpals and that too multiple metacarpals, they are usually associated with dislocation of the involved carpometacarpal joints. And these patients definitely require operative management. That is because the deformity, the displacement, all this may result in severe deformity. And the best time to operate on such cases is immediately after injury. But some patients do present late. What do we do in those cases? Can we get good results by operating? Yes, we can. Let us go through a case study to understand what are all the important points to get good results in delayed presentation of metacarpal basal fractures of the fingers? The case that we are going to discuss today and learn from is a patient who sustained multiple finger metacarpals base fractures with dislocations of the carpometacarpal joints. This is quite a common injury which occurs in road traffic accidents or high energy blunt injuries involving the hand. This 25 year old man presented with blunt injuries sustained on the non-dominant left hand about 5 days earlier in a road traffic accident. He had visited many hospitals but since they advised surgery he was not willing and hence refused treatment at any of the hospitals. He was now worried because of the pain and the swelling of the hand. The range of extension and flexion of the fingers and opposition of the thumb were all restricted. The swelling on the palm and the dorsum of the hand were significant. X-rays revealed a fracture of the base of the second, third and fourth metacarpals with dislocations of these carpometacarpal joints. These metacarpals were displaced to the radial side. A true lateral view would have showed that these metacarpals were also displaced volarwards. We can make out a splintering of the bases of the second, third and fourth metacarpals. The abutment of the displaced second metacarpal into the thumb web space displacement of the third and fourth metacarpal bases, the intact fifth carpometacarpal joint and intact carpal bones. So first we counseled the patient and his attenders. We talked about the problems if these fractures were left untreated. We talked about the problems of medical management that is just a POP because that was the first question that the patient and the attenders asked. We told them that the dislocation is so bad that function may not result even after just POP application. We then talked about the benefits of surgical management in which we would be able to reduce the edema and the compression on the hand and also get back good function. We then talked about the expected results and then what is expected of the patient including his part in doing the physiotherapy and following post-operative instructions correctly. A decompression fasciotomy and carpal tunnel release was done on the day of admission under regional block anesthesia. Decompression wounds were also made on the dorsal aspect. We need to plan the incision correctly so that we do not cause any compromise of the blood supply of the overlying skin and at the same time we get a good exposure of the fractured and dislocated joints because we have to access the second, third and fourth metacarpal bases. The problem here was that the decompression wounds were present. Making two parallel incisions 
using the same decompression wounds was not a good idea because the skin between these two incisions would be a narrow bipedical flap which might not survive. Hence, we planned an incision in this way in the form of a Z. After the incisions were made, the flaps were raised and the underlying tendons were retracted. The dislocations were first reduced. To make sure that the dislocations were reduced correctly, we aligned the base of the second metacarpal to the trapezoid. And on the ulnar side, we checked this reduction with the undislocated base of the fifth metacarpal. K wires were then passed proximo distally so that first the K wires when passed proximally exited at the level of the wrist and while this was done the wrist was kept in acute flexion. Then the wire was passed retrograde. Then the K wire was passed then the K wire was advanced into the distal segment of the second, third, and fourth metacarpals till the cortex was engaged by the sharp end of the K wire. Care was taken not to breach the cortex of the head of the metacarpals. The wounds were then closed over PVC tube drains. We sometimes use the scalp vein set tubing itself. The suturing of the dorsal exposure wounds and the suturing of the volar decompression wound were done. A below elbow dorsal POP slab was applied with the metacarpophalangeal joints in 90 degrees of flexion. The wrist of course was transfixed in 20 degrees of flexion and this was maintained as such. Immobilization was done for 3 weeks. Absolute hand elevation was advised. Analgesics, antibiotics and anti-inflammatory drugs were given for 5 days and patient was discharged with the advice to review every week. At the end of three weeks, the POP was removed and the K wires were also removed under local anesthetic infiltration. The patient was able to bring the wrist to the neutral position without much pain immediately after removal of the wires. If you note the x-ray that was taken immediately after the removal of the wires, the fractures are still in the healing phase and they are still sticky. It is very important at this point to protect these joints at this stage of time. If they are not protected and movements of the fingers are started, these unhealed joints will invariably buckle and lead to healing of the bones in a deformed position. So we applied a detachable wrist stabilization POP. If necessary, this can be done under regional anesthesia if the patient is having pain while extending the wrist to the neutral position. This detachable splint should be maintained for a minimum of 3 weeks. That is because the wrist should be stable when the movements are started on the fingers. The appearance of the hands, both the volar side and the dorsal side after removal of the POP. Patient was able to get back the wrist in neutral position after removal of the K wires. The instructions for him were as follows. This is actually a copy of the instructions I had written out for the patient in his outpatient record. I'll just read out the entries. To wash daily with soap and water, coconut oil massage, refer to physiotherapy at the nearest hospital for metacarpophalangeal joints passive flexion and active flexion exercises, ultrasound scar massage, pronation supination exercises, thumb apposition exercises and extension exercises for the fingers with scar massage. This is the range of movements that was available about one week after removal of the POP. Here we will note that there is not much of metacarpophalangeal joint flexion and that should be encouraged. At about 2 months after the initial surgery, we will note that there is a good amount of metacarpophalangeal joint flexion but the fingers are still not touching the palm and opposition of the thumb has improved but not complete. Extension at the wrist is still restricted and this also must be concentrated on during the further therapy. At 5 months post-op, 
we can see that the scar has settled well and the patient has an almost full range of flexion movements of the fingers. But the thumb opposition is still not complete. The scar on the dorsum of the hand has also settled well and extension of both the wrist and fingers are full. This is the finding at 9 months after the surgery, a full range of flexion and full range of extension and a complete opposition movements of the thumb. This is very important to achieve because the original fracture dislocation had been abutting on the thumb web. So it is important that we concentrate on the opposition exercises of the thumb also. The x-ray taken at 9 months showed a good healing of the fractures. The learning points that we have derived from this presentation are as follows. A delayed presentation of multiple metacarpal fractures with dislocations is quite common. Decompression may be needed and it needs to be combined with carpal tunnel release and must be done as early as possible. After the decompression or on admission of the patient, hand elevation and anti-inflammatory drugs are essential. We need to plan for early fixation because medical management of such multiple metacarpal fractures is not fruitful. The incisions must be planned well to afford a good exposure of the involved bone and the other structures and also not compromise the vascularity of the skin. When fixing the fractures or reducing the dislocations in badly crushed structures, anatomical alignment is most important. While fixing the fractures, do not transfix or fix the metacarpophalangeal joints. The movements at these joints are very important. The wrist can withstand fixation and can be corrected almost immediately after removal of the offending wire. A POP slab needs to be applied with metacarpophalangeal joints in 90 degrees of flexion. Earliest removal of K-wires by around 3 weeks should be done and followed up with stabilization of the wrist while starting active mobilization. This is a very important step and the patient must follow up once a week for one month and at the same time undergo hand therapy rigorously. I hope you enjoyed the video. I enjoyed making it. Please click on the shown links to see more about different types of flaps, the stepladder abdominal flap, the volar advancement flap on the fingers and others. And do not forget to subscribe to keep connected with the latest in learning hand surgery.